So this is graduation season and many graduates are or soon will hopefully be comparing job offers from different potential employers and they will be looking carefully at compensation and benefits and advancement opportunities and employment culture because whom you commit to serve has tremendous applications for your family, for your health, for your future, for the stability of maybe how you invest your life. And if someone knew that we were considering a potential employer was shady, say a Bernie Madoff or a, what is it, Sam Friedman, whatever the FTX gentleman was, or perhaps a company that was about to go under. So if you had a job offer for Bed Bath & Beyond, you would want someone to tap you on the shoulder and say uh, they're actually in bankruptcy, or likewise with Silicon Valley Bank. If we were about to work for and commit ourselves to laboring for a bad boss on a vain venture, we would very much appreciate someone warning us and saying there's a better employer with a better path that's gonna to lead to a better future. And that's what Jesus does for us in this text. He is going to warn us away from a bad boss who wants to lead us on a vain venture and instead tell us to serve the one true God of the universe whose retirement plan is out of this world. So with that cheesy comment, I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, where our Lord is going to talk about serving God gains lasting treasures, serving God enlightens our soul, and serving God precludes serving wealth. It's one or the other. You don't get to ride both horses. In the first 18 verses of chapter 6, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount has been talking to us about hypocrisy, about practicing our righteousness to be noticed by men. And when we perform pious, pious practices like giving alms to the poor or fasting or praying in order to impress others, that's all the reward we get. But when we do it to please our Lord, then He will reward us. And God's rewards are always more rewarding. And kind of on this theme now of rewards and whom are we laboring for and rewards that are full but false versus those that are enduring and pleasing to God, he's going to talk to us about money, a theme that he's going to return to again and again and again in the Gospels because it is so pervasive. If there is an idol in America, it is wealth, it is materialism, it is money, it is mammon, as we'll see him named in a bit. And so Jesus is going to warn us if you serve wealth, then you will forfeit your treasures, you will darken your soul, and you will forfeit the opportunity to work for God. And therefore, he pleads with us, he urges us, he warns us, as God the Son, commit yourself to work for God the Father. Let's look in verses 19 and 20 initially. Here he presents us two investment opportunities, two ways to store up treasures for ourselves. Now the word store up means to lay aside for future use. It is tucking away. It is saving for a rainy day. Uh, Texas has a rainy day fund that is now thankfully in the billions of dollars that should the day come when it's going to rain and we can't bring in a harvest and we need our savings to live on, then that's what we will have stored up for ourselves. And people do this. And Jesus is telling us that it is a good thing to set aside, to plan for the future, to store up. Uh, the same verb is used twice by Paul to the Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, he said, Put aside and save some money on the first day of every week so that there will be no need for collections when I come to you. So Paul was raising up funds from the Gentile churches around the Mediterranean world to bring for famine relief for the Jewish believers in Israel. And he was trying to bring Jews and Gentiles together by having the Gentiles who had gotten their gospel from the Jews give material blessings for their Jewish forefathers. And they were to store up every week on the first day of every week, on Sunday, already they're worshiping on the Lord's Day. And this was so that when it came time to deliver it, I'm sorry, I just saw another couple of Georges come in. This is going to be a distracting couple of weeks with the missionaries arriving. Great to see y'all. Likewise, in 2 Corinthians 12, he says that when he comes, he's not going to be a burden on them because it's the parent's job to take care of the children and not vice versa. To store up for the kids, like Paul, the founder of the church, the parent of the church in Corinth, had stored up for them so that he could serve them. It's not the issue of storing up, but where we store up, which is related to what we store up. Uh, literally, Jesus says, treasure your treasures. He uses the Greek verb and then a related Greek noun. So treasure up your treasures. Find that's what's valuable for them and be stocking them away and storing them away. And he's going to give us a reason why to invest them in heaven and not on earth. And the first is, only heavenly investments are secure. 
Only those investments are safe. So as you plan for retirement, and especially as you near retirement, you need to make sure that you're investing in T-bills and not NFTs, non-fungible tokens. Uh, you want to make sure that you're investing in AAA bonds and not junk bonds finding silver in the Sudan. You want to make sure that you're investing in large cap stocks and not new startups. You care for the security of your investment because otherwise you can lose it all. Anything that we store up on earth is going to be subject to loss and ultimately is going to be doomed to loss because even the earth itself will melt away with intense heat, the Bible says. And Jesus is going to give us several metaphors to make this real for us. So if you were saving in the first century world, you didn't invest in bonds or mutual funds or stocks or T-bills. You would invest in commodities or currency or precious metal or cloth. Bolts of cloth could be very, very valuable. So he's going to take these very real ways of storing wealth and show us the risk that they're exposed to as everything on earth is. The first one he says is moth. And this is specifically the word for the moth, the moth larvae. So the moths would plant their eggs in cloth so that when they hatched, the babies would have something to eat. It's also used of the worms that would eat away wood or books. But more broadly, Jesus is using it to refer to any animal, any insect, any mouse, any rat, any moth, any critter that can come in and eat up what you've stocked away. And so we have a brother here who, uh, during COVID, he went to Detroit to visit a truck company that had tens of thousands of brand new trucks sitting on a lot waiting for that chip to come from Asia. And while it waited, rats got in and ate up the wires, ate up the insulation, ate up the upholstery, and they were scrapping of tens of thousands of brand new off the assembly line trucks because the rats got in and ate them. The moths ate away what was good for them. So that can happen. Rust literally means eating. And this can be whether food sacrificed to idols or eating of our daily bread. And this is going to refer to anything. So it's not just corrosion of a metal. It can also be mold or mildew or corrosion or anything that gradually eats away at something that we store long-term. So uh, Michael has a brother who's into comic books in a big way. And he was helping a friend sell some comic books. And I thought, well, I'll go back to my comic book collection because I think I've got some old comics that might be valuable and maybe I can sell them. And I found a first edition compilation of Star Wars comic books because when Star Wars came out in 1976 or whenever it was, we saw it in the theater. My Christmas present that year was the LP of the Star Wars soundtrack. I had Star Wars comic books going back from the day. And when I found them, they were so covered in gunk and goo that not only could I not sell them, I couldn't read them, I didn't want to touch them. And I ended up throwing them all away. And that can happen. Now, speaking of comic books, when I was in second grade, I sold a large collection of older comic books from the 40s and 50s that someone had given me for about $20 so that I could buy a new spinning reel for my fishing rod. And the gentleman, after he bought the box, said, uh, by the way, some of these are really valuable. You shouldn't have sold these. And he told this poor young lad who had sold them for a quarter that they were worth much more money than that. And to add insult to injury, the reel that I bought soon broke and I threw it away too. <laughs> and things that we store up, the elements can get at, the animals can get at, and another thing that I learned through that lesson, thieves can get at. And there are still thieves that break in and steal electronics and saves and gun collections. And of course now they can steal your identity and hack into your account. They can even come up next to you and read the RFID signal off your wallet while you're standing at a gas pump. Thieves can come and take what you store away. Every one of us has had something that we have seen ruined, maybe a record that was chipped, a vase that was cracked, money that we buried in a can in the backyard never to be found again or found in worse condition than when we planted it. Think in your mind of something valuable that you've lost, that you tucked away for safekeeping and then found it later ruined if you didn't misplace it forever. Now realize that that is going to happen to literally everything on earth. There is nothing on earth that endures forever because not even the earth endures forever. 
Now, some of you are old enough to have seen the episode, I forget the gentleman's name, uh, the journalist when he was going to open up Al Capone's vault, and he came in there and all the cameras were on it, and it was empty. Or those who have found an ancient Egyptian tomb, and it was empty. Or I read an account once of a gentleman who had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on a valuable bottle of wine, only to find that it had turned to vinegar. And there is just simply nothing on this earth that lasts forever. There is no safe invest investment ultimately on earth. And if you say, well, none of that's going to happen in my lifetime likely, that raises up another point. None of us know how long our lifetime will be. None of us are guaranteed a tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed to make it through this day. None of us are guaranteed another moment. And that also is a danger of storing up for ourselves treasures on earth but not in heaven. In a parallel passage, Jesus says in Luke 12, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Same word, store up. And then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. None of us are guaranteed another moment. And one day when we do get into heaven, none of our earthly currency is going to be any good. Uh, it's all Confederate money at that point. But there will be an audit. and There will be an, an inventory. And we will find out what we've stored up for God. And so Jesus says, don't store up treasures on earth to the neglect of treasures on heaven. And that's his next point, storing up treasures in heaven. Oh, by the way, as he finishes that peril, parable, here's his application in verses 33 and 34 of Luke chapter 12. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we can't only and always be only serving, uh, soaring up for ourselves treasures on earth because they're exposed to loss or our loss of life will make them worthless someday. Instead, we should be storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. Here is a secure investment. Uh, there are no keys in heaven because there's no thieves in heaven. There's no passwords. There's no pin numbers. There's no biometric IDs because there's no scams and swindlers and robbers in heaven. Uh, there are no moths and rat and mice to eat away what's in heaven. There is no corrosion or rust. They never polish the pearly gates. The streets of gold are never tarnished. And everything is going to be perfectly safe in heaven if you store up your treasures there. And that's his appeal to us. Be mindful that you will spend an eternity in heaven or apart from God in hell. And therefore, knowing that our time on earth is just this little blip, this breath, the fog on the mirror that we left in our shower this morning. That's all this lifetime is, even if we live 100 years. Eternity is forever. And so we need to be storing up with the mind for forever. Those of us with kids in college, exhort them, be mindful of these four years because the decisions and the choices and how hard you work in these four years have large outcomes for the rest of your life. Four years of play isn't worth 40 years of a life you don't want. But that same principle applies to us because a hundred years on earth is a blink, is, is just a blip. It's a moat compared to the eternity that he waits us. And so Jesus says, store up for yourself treasures in heaven. And he gives us many examples of how to do this. For example, Matthew 19, 21. If you wish to be complete, he says to the rich young ruler, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. When we sacrificially give to those in need, we are storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. He says in Matthew 5, 11 and 12, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. When you suffer persecution for the gospel, you are storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Whether that's being mocked by our peers, 
not given an advancement by our boss, being looked down upon by those around us, or sometimes much harsher persecution in parts of the world. When we suffer for Christ, Christ rewards us in heaven. He says in Matthew 5, and 46, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Which implies when we love those who don't love us, but who hate us and set our enemies, that we do have reward in heaven. When we love the unlovely, when we love the unlovable, when we love those who don't love us back, who actually mean us malice and mean us wrong, then God sees that and rewards us in heaven. He says in Matthew 6, 18, when we fast in private, when we pray in secret, when we give so that only the Lord knows, God sees all those things. And all of those things, Jesus says, will be rewarded by God. He says in Matthew 10, Whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Uh, when we help God's servants all along the way, whether sending missionaries out or helping those in need who are brothers and sisters in Christ, our Heavenly Father is pleased with that and He gives us rewards in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3, He who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. He's talking there about him, the church planter of Corinth, Apollos who came and led the church afterwards. One planted, he planted, Apollos watered, God caused the growth, but those who served in their local church each received their reward. When we feed God's body, when we care for God's church, when we serve in the local body that we're all a part of, we are storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, If I share the gospel voluntarily, I have a reward. If against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. When we share the gospel, uh, we have three saints from our family going to England on Wednesday to be there for the coronation of King Charles. And there are going to be 700 people gathering from around the world in London this week, passing out more than a million tracts, sharing with them the symbolism of this is how a coronation helps us understand the king of the universe who sent his son to die and to rise on our behalf. And they're going to be there just sharing the gospel. And they will be rewarded for that investment. Just a couple of others. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. When you do a good job for a bad boss, God sees that. When you do a good job for someone who doesn't reward you well here, God will reward you well later. None of it is wasted. And finally, Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to render every man according to what he has done. There will be a final reckoning. There will be a final reward. And this last verse reminds us that these other things are just examples. They're exemplary, not exhaustive. They just give us an indication that whatever we do for the Lord, the Lord sees and honors. We start receiving dividends now. We'll receive the inheritance in full someday. But all of us should be living our lives not merely to accumulate worldly wealth, but to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven by doing things for the King of heaven who sees and rewards his servants. Um, in the fourth century in modern day Istanbul, back at that time Constantinople, there was a well-known pastor, he was the bishop, named John Chrysostom. Uh, the last word means golden mouth because he was such a powerful preacher. And a wealthy woman there in the capital city came and asked him to help her invest some of her wealth. And he said, happily. And then she came later and said, how are my investments doing? He said, wondrously. Would you like to see? She goes, absolutely. And so he took her to the hospital for the indigent poor and the soup kitchen for the hungry and the orphanage for the abandoned children. And he said, Madam, you have lots of worldly wealth and it is gathering you worldly rewards, but I have chosen to invest your funds in heaven and every child that is helped and every poor that is fed and every sick that is cured is because of your efforts partly and you have rewards in heaven. Be grateful. Now, we don't have recorded her response to this. She probably was sheepish and chagrined to balk at how he invested her money. But that principle is right, that we should be storing up for ourselves with a view to eternity. Another reason we do this is because of what it does to our heart. Look at verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus started by saying, in the future, if you invest poorly, you won't have the retirement that you're expecting. It won't benefit you. 
But now he says, but in the present, if your treasure is on earth, guess where your heart will be? On earth. You can corrupt a heart if you set it on the wrong treasure. So um, I grew up reading comic books. I'm sorry, this is the analogy that came to mind. But there was an old comic strip about a character named Scrooge McDuck, who was Daffy Duck's rich uncle. And he was always being pursued by the three Beagle Boys who were trying to steal his money. So he secreted it around the globe in various places, a uh, dormant volcano, an ancient aqueduct, in a hill and a mountain. And then he invited his nephew Daffy along with his, or uh, not Daffy, Donald, thank you. I got my Looney Tunes confused. Donald and his nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, to go on a worldwide tour, not realizing that the Beagle Boys were on his heel, and everywhere he went, they watched where his eyes went. Because guess where his eyes went? Everywhere his treasure was. And he gave away his treasure by his eyes. Because that's he didn't care about the Colosseum, he just looked to the aqueduct where the money was hidden. He didn't care about the grandeur of the mountain. He just looked to the cave where the treasure was. His heart went where his treasure was. Now, spoiler alert, the Beagle Boys do steal the treasure, but then he's able to recover it because guess what they did with the treasure? They hid it, and guess how he discovered it? He followed their eyes to see where their treasure was. Our hearts always follow our treasures. Uh, we do this every day in a daily ritual. So, you remember the old children's song, Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes, Knees, and Toes? Well, today, what do we do? Purse, wallet, keys, and phone, keys, and phone, purse, wallet, keys, and phone, keys, and phones. Which one did I leave at home? You know, and we kind of go through the same because those are our valuables that we carry with us every day. And we're constantly padding and checking because that's where our treasure is. And so Jesus warns us that all of us put our heart with our treasure. And that starts with a baby with a pacifier, to the toddler with the blanket, to the teen with the cell phone, to the mom and dad with the car in the house. Our hearts go where our treasure is. And if we're not careful, like Gollum, we'll keep stroking that thing until it corrodes our soul. And so Jesus warns us, don't let your heart be earthward. Uh, Dante, I'm gonna recover myself for some of the collegiates in the midst. Dante in his divine comedy in the fifth circle of purgatory. So you start in inferno, then you go to purgatory, those that are paying off their sins to get into heaven. And on the fifth level is for the greedy, either the covetous or the profligate, those who hoarded money or those who spent it too widely. And they're all face down on the hard pavement. And Dante, seeing them, says, I discovered people there who wept, lying upon the ground, all face turned down. And he asked them, why are you in this posture? And they say to him, just as we did not lift our eyes on high, but set our sight on earthly things, so justice here impels our eyes towards the earth. All they wanted was earth, and so that's what they got was earth. Not only will we lose our treasure in the future, if that's all we store it for on earth, it corrupts our heart now, and it corrodes us in ways. And so important is this that Jesus builds on it in verses 22 and 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, there are some ancient Greek th thinkers who thought that light came out of our eyes and that if Jesus was operating out of a Greek background, that maybe he was thinking that our proper outlook on the world would lighten a dark world. And that's not at all what's going on here. Jesus is writing in a Jewish context and he's simply ob observing that the eye is the lens that lets light into our body. And if that lens is clear, then we let light in. And if that lens is dark, then we let darkness in. It'll be still more darkness. And so we have to be careful to let the lens of our eyes be clear by focusing them single-mindedly. Uh, that's what the word clear means, single. If we are single focused on seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness, then as Chris is going to teach us next week, all of the things that we need are going to be added to us as well. But if all we value is earthly things that are gathering up earthly treasures, then we darken our vision with these cataracts and only little light gets in and it darkens us. Uh, we can get maybe some glimpses of what Jesus is saying because we have other expressions. If you've ever heard about someone who sees red, 
that they're so furious, they're so enraged that everything takes on a red tint. Sometimes that's played out in film. Supposedly it comes from a bull that sees the red matador cape and charges it. But when you're in a fury, everything you look at is tainted by that anger. Uh, Shakespeare talked about green-eyed jealousy, that if you only are covetous, if you're only envious, then it tints the way that you look at other people. Uh, sometimes we talk about people who have a jaundiced eye, whose eye is perpetually negative and pessimistic. There's this yellow film over their eyes that they don't let all the light in. And this is almost imagining if you, you know, sometimes we have sunglasses that are different tints other than dark. And if this was a gold covered lens, then everything that we see in the world gets tinted with our worldliness. And now when I see someone, I say, is that someone that I can exploit or use? When I see something, is that something that I can acquire and get? We covet. Everything we look at becomes, how can I use this for my advance? How can I make this person into a client, into a customer? How can I shop for this, gain this? Where do I get another storage unit to put that? And our eyes are always looking at the world through a worldly glance if we're not careful. And Jesus says, therefore, you got to let your eye be clear. Uh, my brother was in a company once and he asked a coworker, how can you tell when the money's getting to you? And the gentleman said, watch your daydreams on your commute home. So when your mind is idle, when you're just riding on a mower or driving home, and your mind just wanders where it will, if it's wandering to the next car, the next boat, the next house, then you know where your heart is. And David really took that to heart. And he actually went into Mexico as a missionary because he wanted to make sure that didn't happen to him. But it can happen. And so Jesus says, make sure that your eyes are clear Otherwise, it will change your soul into something dark that you don't want. It needs to be enlightened. Keep it focused on God. Because ultimately, he says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters. You can't serve God fully and money fully. The word serve is actually a word related to slave because slavery was uh, dominant in this culture as it was in, as it is in many you can't be enslaved to two owners because ultimately you will serve the one over the other. If they give you contrary commands, you will follow the command of one and not the other. Judas followed Jesus, but he also wanted to get money. And at the end of the day, which one ran out or won out? Money did. And he sold his Lord for pieces of silver. Do you remember a character in the Old Testament, a servant of Elijah the prophet Gehazi? And Gehazi started out great until he noticed what? Naaman the leper was healed. He was going to give all this wealth. Elijah turned it away. Gehazi went after him, took it. And what happened to him? He became leprous. And it was this symbolic judgment that he had this corroded soul eaten away by grief. And now it was reflected in corroded flesh. And money can get at us if we're not careful. And so Jesus warns us, you must choose to serve either God or money because the Bible says that money is an idol, something that we put in the place of God, something that is finite, that, that we make ultimate, something that is limited, that we make infinite, something that is part of the creation that we put over the creator. And when we do this, that's an idol, because what we're doing is we're making this the object that we're looking to, to give us our identity, our security, our happiness, our hope, something to deliver us from danger. And there are lots of idols in this world, but again, for Americans, money is our idol. Uh, most people who are money-centered don't view themselves as idolaters. But Paul says in Colossians 3, 5, Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry, my translation says. The actual literal Greek is greed, which is idolatry, is actually the Greek. Greed is idolatry because when we are consumed with money, we are saying that's the ultimate thing that we're living for. That's the ultimate object that we're serving. And we'll make sacrifices for it. For the sake of money, people will sacrifice their character, their family, their health, their soul. People make terrible sacrifices for the sake of money. And money is a greedy idol that is never satiated and never satisfied. And it will keep taking and taking and taking. Um, I grew up in a family business and my brothers and I were exposed to some pretty unique opportunities to be around wealthy people who had done well in business. 
And one of the wonderful things that that did for me as a young man was disillusion me about wealth. Because these were very bright, accomplished people. They were not all good husbands and fathers. And I just saw that's not what the world is all about. That's not what I want with all of my life. And that was a mercy shown me. Uh, John Calvin says that man is a veritable factory of idols. That what we do as fallen human creatures is we take the material stuff of this world that God the Creator made and we fabricate it into different idols that we put in the place of God. And money is an idol that we need to be aware of. In fact, if you have the King James Version or the New King James, it doesn't say wealth or money. It says what? Mammon. Mammon is an era, it's a transliteration, which means they've just substituted Greek letters for another word in another language. And that is an Aramaic word meaning wealth or property. And why would Jesus transliterate another word from another language? Well, what most commentators think is he is personifying wealth as an idol. And some of your Bibles may even have mammon capitalized. Here is God, the creator of all, who wants to reward you in heaven. And then here is a false God, mammon, who puts himself in the place of God, or that we put in the place of God, and he also is beckoning for our service. Uh, my youngest brother is a Simpsons fan. Bill, this is for you. Uh, Monty Montgomery, I'm sorry, Monty Montgomery Burns, the wealthy Scrooge who owns the factory, lives on the corner of Mammon Street and Croatia Streets. And so because he's indicating Croesus was a rich king, Mammon is his god, and that's where Montgomery Burns lives. Uh, there's another person I used to work in ministry with, and then he left ministry, vocational ministry to go into finance because it make more money for his family. He needed to. But I used to jokingly refer to him as the Mammonite, and I was going to have that put on his desk. But Mammon is an idol that gets a lot of worshipers. Uh, in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, John Milton presents Mammon as the demon that Satan says to go and accumulate the metals and the precious metals to build Pandemonium, which is the capital city of the demons. And this is how he's described by John Milton. Mammon led them on. Mammon, the least erected spirit that fell from heaven. That is the least upright because he was bent over. Why was he bent over? For even in heaven, his looks and thoughts were always downward. Bent admiring more the riches of heaven's pavement, trodden gold, than anything divine or holy else enjoyed in vision beatific. Even in heaven, Mammon the angel was more attracted to the streets of gold than to the God that they just were there to reflect his glory. By him first men also, and by his suggestion taught, ransacked the center, and with impious hands rifled the bowels of their mother earth for treasures better hid. So why do we strip mine for coal in West Virginia? Why do we enslave people to get mines in South Africa, diamonds? Why do we, because mammon drives us to burrow our greedy paws into Mother Earth at whatever cost they may be and pour whatever pollutions we need to, mercury and otherwise, to get at the precious metals. Soon his crew had opened the hill a spacious wound and digged out ribs of gold, but let none admire that riches grow in hell. That soil may best deserve the precious bane. Mammon is not a friend. And he's not a friendly God. And many people have made terrible sacrifices to the God of Mammon. You know, it's interesting. Uh, my wife and I have a daughter graduating college next week on uh, May 12th. And for many families, you want your children to study hard so they can get into a good school, to earn a marketable degree, where they get good grades, to get a good job, and we define a good job by that which pays a lot. Because if they get a job that pays a lot, they can move from a Corolla to a Camry to an Avalon to a Lexus. And then you can get a convertible, an RV, a motorcycle, and some other vehicles. And then you can move from an apartment to a townhome to a starter home to a bigger home till you build your dream home, till you buy vacation homes, all of which then need refurbishing and refurnishing. And there is this constant growing, and, and, and I realize we're striking close to home here because this is the American dream. And we need to balance it by saying that there is nothing intrinsically wrong with material possessions. Uh, those who work hard often do get into good schools. They often earn good degrees. They do get good jobs. They do a good job at that good job, and they are compensated well for it. There's nothing wrong with that. 
as long as it doesn't get our heart, as long as it doesn't get our soul, as long as that's not where we're storing up our treasures, that's where we're placing our identity, that's what we're really is building a little kingdom on earth with no thought to the, att- to the heaven that awaits. And we need to be careful there. Uh, likewise, I'm looking back at Tim Evans, who does our financial peace class with his wife, Jennifer. And those who steward the resources well often are debt averse. They get out of debt. They do save up. They're able to save a retirement. They pass on something to their kids. And they do raise them up to be wise with their money. And following biblical principles can give you a certain amount of material stability. There's nothing wrong with that. And then God gives certain people just the Midas touch. Uh, some people have a keen eye for value and opportunities. Some people just seem everything they touch turns to gold. And God uses that in wonderful ways. The Green family that does Hobby Lobby has done much good with the money that they have earned. So I'm not here saying that poverty is the only way. We're not Franciscans. But money is a dangerous path to follow. Because it can get your heart. It can occlude your eye. And it can corrode a soul. And it can make you spend a life, waste a life, accumulating earthly things that are all going to be eaten away by rust and moths and thieves. And even if we outlive them, they don't carry over into heaven. And Midas was meant to be a warning against materialism, not a model to follow. So King Midas was an ancient king in Phrygia, which is in uh, the middle of modern day Turkey. And according to legend, a satyr uh, was drunk and lost his way and Midas took care of him. And so his son, looking for his father, uh, the son Dionysius, the god, found his father at Midas' house and wanted to reward him. So he said, I will give you any wish you want. What do you want? And what did Midas want? I wish that everything I touch turned to gold. So he touched a stick and made a gold rod. He touched a rock and made a gold ingot. And things got pretty exciting until he touched his food and his cup and found out that gold is really hard to chew and to swallow. And then his daughter rushed in to give her daddy a hug. And this flesh and blood daughter became cold gold statue. And he prayed for a way that this curse that he had wished for would go away. And if you think about Midas a little bit further, you know, Midas could have wished for a touch that would heal any disease or that would give hope to the despairing or reconcile parties in conflict or bring it abundant. There's so many things he could have wished for. Why did he wish for this? Because that's what was in his heart. And that could be in our hearts too, and that's not what we want. Jesus warns us, you cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And someday you've got to make a choice. And Jesus, the King of heaven, who will judge us someday, says, make the wise one. So I like to listen to audible books. Uh, I really enjoy books in any form. And yesterday I finished reading King Solomon's Mind by the English writer, Ryder Haggard. And there these adventurers go across desert and mountain, face many jeopardous hazards on their way to find the diamond mines of Suleiman, King Solomon. And they finally fight a mighty battle. Thousands are slain. They make their way into the cave. The old witch doctress leads them in And there's wealth unimaginable. I mean, gold ingots, gold coins with ancient Hebrew inscriptions, chest of diamonds the size of fists, the wealth of a lifetime. And then she locks them in the cave. And in an instant, it becomes worthless. And Quartermain says, Truly wealth, which men spend their lives in acquiring, is a valueless thing at the last. At at the end of the day, It only takes one scary medical diagnosis to make all the money worthless. Or what would we give to have our child do well? Or to let a family member know the Lord? At the end of the day, again, money is a tool. It's a good tool. It's a terrible master. It's a tyrant. Don't serve mammon. Serve God. Store up for yourselves treasures in earth. I'm sorry, treasures in heaven. James 5 says, Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted. Your garments have become moth-eaten. Guess we got that language? Jesus, half-brother. Your gold and your silver have rusted, corroded. The rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you should have stored up your treasure. So Jesus, the Son of God, who 
died for us and rose for us and is coming back to reign over us and will judge us someday, says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Watch your eye, because worldly lies don't let God's light in, and it leaves a dimmed and a darkened soul. And at the end of the day, don't fool yourself that you can do both. You cannot serve God and mammon. God said so. Would you pray with me? Father, this is a convicting, much-needed message because we uh, are in a greedy culture and we are in a worldly world and our flesh likes the temptations that they lay before us. And we confess that none of us are single-eyed when it comes to heaven, that it's rare that we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And the reality is we want all that this world has to offer and then heaven beside. And to get that, we will sometimes go to work for wealth rather than for God. We will serve an idol, mammon, rather than the one true God, Yahweh. Would you help us each to know what we need to confess, what shifts of priorities we need to make? Would you let us know how to rebalance our portfolio? <laughs> because we're all earthly, heavily, earthly heavy and heavenly light and help us to begin storing up treasures for ourselves in heaven by loving you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, by loving our neighbor as ourself, and by loving our brothers and sisters in Christ as Christ loved us. Help us to do this, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.